have a look at this very strange picture. In the 19th century, a Victorian reverend uncovered the whitewash at Pickering Church in North Yorkshire and found a whole load of paintings. Far from being unusual, these paintings were the sorts of things you'd have found in most churches in the medieval period. Most people in the medieval people, uh, period who attended church could not read and write, and so getting them to understand their services, which were delivered in Latin, a language they couldn't understand, was incredibly difficult. Instead, many of them would learn their Bible stories through looking at lavish illustrations all over the church walls, very different to what we think of as a church today. This is one such painting, something known as a doom painting. Today's online lesson is on why was the church so important in medieval times. Your first do now task is based upon the, the image I've just described to you. Describe what you can see happening in the picture and what might this mean and what might it represent. Pause the video while you complete this task. So what you might have identified here is there is a giant orange fiery beast. This represented hell. And for medieval people, this wasn't just an abstract concept, somewhere awful that you might go when you died. This would have been a place literally filled with evil, ugly, horrible demons. You might be able to see a couple of those demons at the back. However, these people are being offered the means of their salvation, as Jesus, the man with brown hair and the beard, is leading them out of the mouth of the beast. The idea being that as long as you follow Jesus and his teachings, you will not end up in hell. Doom paintings like this were reasonably common in churches, and despite their horrifying nature, they give us a really good insight into the way that medieval people worshipped. The Normans and God as you might recall from other lessons, the Normans were very religious. For example, William the Conqueror said that God was on his side when he won the Battle of Hastings. They believed that God had helped them win at the Battle of Hastings. As a result, the church had become very important in Norman England. Also, William believed that the only person above him was God, or indeed the Pope. Great churches and cathedrals were built, and religion became an important part of everyday life. Indeed, the buildings of stone uh, cathedrals and churches became part of the Normans' way of showing that they were here to stay. Religion helped also to explain difficult events, for example, people's illnesses and astronomical phenomena and disasters that people couldn't otherwise explain. It was an escape from the dullness of everyday life. They were impressive buildings constructed and decorated by the local community and a centre of their social life. For example, there was something called the, the Church Ales. Yes, beer would have been drunk at these, but they were so much more than that. Priests could save your soul through services, for example, the Mass, christening, and the Last Rites, which were crucial parts of everybody's spiritual life. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a reading task where we'll make some structured notes about the role of the priest within the community. There are four sections to this. You're going to make some notes on their religious duties, their practical responsibilities, Charity work that people did, both for the priest and done by the priest. And social and entertainment. In other words, how did the church actually ha help people have fun too? Here are some extension activities. If you find yourself finishing the reading task early, you can come back to these and do these later on. As a further extension, priests are often seen as having an easier life than peasants. In what ways might a priest misbehave? And do you think that ordinary peasants would have felt jealous of the peace, priest? Explain your point of view. Okay, so have a look at what the timestamp is now. It should be around 3 minutes 55. So if you come back to uh, timestamp 4 minutes, you'll be able to do these tasks. On subsequent sc uh, screens, I'm going to show you the reading. You might have a handout of your own which you can use to do some highlighting and some note taking. If not, you can simply take your notes from the screen as I go through them paragraph by paragraph. Section 1. By the end of the 12th century, there were about 9,000 parish priests in England. Often they were very poor and unable to read or write. They had to learn Latin services off by heart. To make ends meet, they spent a lot of time working in the fields, tending their animals and crops just like the peasants. There was a special piece of land put aside for them. This was known as the glebe. Priests performed a variety of tasks, both spiritual and practical. They would hear confessions and give forgiveness to people who were sorry for their sins. But they would also be expected to keep the church in good repair. The church would be the best building in the village. Its walls would be covered with pictures of saints and scenes from the Bible. 
There would also be painted statues, carvings and stained glass windows. OK, so in a moment you can pause the video and reread this section. Make notes of anything that's in here that would re represent religious duties by the priest. Anything that's a practical responsibility, the sort of thing that they would have to do every day just to make ends meet. If there's any mention of charity or social or entertainment uh, features, then note those down too. But bear in mind, if there is anything that you can't see up here, then just wait. It's likely to come on a future screen, so don't worry, you'll just be able to move on. Pause the video while you make your notes, and then we'll see what sort of things you should have picked up. OK, firstly I'm going to highlight on the screen some examples of religious duties that you should have picked up. If you didn't get some of these, please add them to your list now. Firstly, the first religious duty is that the priest had to learn their Latin services and deliver them off by heart. Then a practical responsibility. They had to spend time working in the fields, tending their animals and crops, just like the peasants did. Another religious duty here. They had to hear confessions and give forgiveness to people who were sorry for their sins but also another practical responsibility. The priest was expected to keep the church in good repair. OK, once you've got down the notes that you need, press play again and we can move on. But for now, while you're completing those notes, press pause. Let's have a look at the next section. As well as looking after the church building, the priest visited the sick, comforted people in times of trouble and gave shelter, food and clothing to the poor. He encouraged rich people to give money to help the needy. Money raised in this way was called alms. The priest performed the three most important ceremonies of a villager's life, christening, marriage and burial. When people were dying, they would send for the priest and he would give them their last rites. He heard them confess all their sins and gave them forgiveness. OK, again, let's see if there are any examples of religious duties, practical responsibilities, charity or social or entertainment factors within this. If you can't find anything for one of those sections, don't worry, it'll likely be in another section. But make some notes under those headings now. Pause the video while you do this. Let's see what you should have picked up upon. Again, if you missed any of these, add them to your notes now. Firstly, we've got an aspect of charity here. Visiting the sick and comforting people in times of trouble was charity provided by the priest, but they also encouraged others, especially the rich, to give money as charity too. That was called alms. For example, an alms house was somewhere that someone could live um, if they couldn't afford a building of their own, and this would be provided by the church as a charity. You may have heard the term before. There's also some religious responsibilities in here though as well. Quite a long one actually. The three most important ceremonies in a villager's life, christening, marriage and burial, were all the religious duties of the priest, as was the, the giving of the last rites and giving people forgiveness before they died. Pause the video again if you need to add to your notes. If not, we'll move on. Section 3. The villagers had to give a tithe, which means a tenth of what they produced to the church. Uh, this would rarely be money, it would be more like a tenth of whatever they grew on their farm. This would be stored in a tithe barn until it was collected and taken away by officials. Very little was given to the priest himself. The villagers were usually glad to help the priest by providing money, labour and goods to keep the church going. The priest would have also helped to organise social events that took place around his church. These included feasts and fairs, puppet shows, archery contests and dances. There were also drinking parties known as the church ales and mystery plays. Events like these involved the whole community and helped to emphasise the central importance of the priest and the church. Alright, you know the score by now. Note down anything under religious duties, practical responsibilities, charity and social and entertainment. If you haven't got anything under social and entertainment so far, then now's your chance. Pause the video while you make your notes. Let's have a look at what you should have picked up on. Firstly, practical responsibilities. Collecting the tithe just to help keep the church afloat and make sure that the priest had uh, everything that he needed to survive. Then we've got an element of charity, the villagers being glad to help the priest by giving money and goods to keep them going. And lastly, we have social and entertainment. The priest would have helped to organise social events, such as feasts, puppet shows, archery contests and dances, and the drinking parties called the church ales. Truly, uh, the 
Church was central to people's lives in a social aspect as well as in a religious aspect. Think about our own holidays. Well, originally that word meant holy days. So saints days, for example. So absolutely the days, uh, the times that people had a day off, it was usually down to a church festival. However, although most priests followed the rules very nicely and were good servants of God for their communities, not all of them were. Read through this source. Is a man a good or bad example of a priest? Let's think why. This is from the records of the Bishop of Hereford, written down in 1397, so it's a primary source from the Middle Ages. This was part of evidence from villagers' statements about their parish priest. Clearly these people had reason to complain. They say that the priest puts his horses and sheep to pasture in the churchyard. They say that the priest was away for six weeks and made no arrangements for a substitute. He spends his time in taverns and there his tongue is loose to the great scandal of everyone. They even say that he is living with a woman, Margaret, and spends more time with her than looking after his parishioners' souls. OK, well, let's break this down one line at a time. Firstly, by putting his animals in the churchyard, that's disrespecting people's graves there. That was supposed to be uh, land that was consecrated and was kept separate from the, the activities of farming. Also, being away for six weeks and not providing a substitute would have meant that there'd be no church services going on. A tavern was a pub, so the insinuation here is that uh, the priest is going and getting drunk and telling everyone lots of secrets about his parishioners. Remember that priests heard all of the people's sins in their confessions and they were supposed to keep this an absolute secret. And finally, perhaps most damningly, he's living with a woman. Priests were not supposed to marry at all. They were supposed to devote their lives to God and to their communities. Well, clearly this priest is not doing as he was told. Here's what you're going to do. Note down some examples of bad behaviour and some quotes from the source that show this and then think about reasons why you can trust that that was something that happened and reasons why you might doubt that that happened. Try and note down at least one part for each of those sections. I'll give an example shortly and then try and come up with some of your own. For example, I've identified that the priest probably had a girlfriend. A quote from the source that supports this is this one here. He is living with a woman, Margaret. Notice that I've put this in quote marks and I've actually taken the text directly from the source. I've not changed it at all. I can trust this because people went to the effort of complaining and, and it was actually recorded in 1397 at the time. It's not something we're guessing about. However, reasons I might doubt that this happened is we don't know exactly who made the complaint or if the priest was ever found guilty. So pause the video here, come up with your own example of bad behaviour, your own quote from the source that shows this, reasons you can trust that this happened and reasons why you might doubt that this happened. Pause the video while you complete this. OK, hopefully you came up with a good example of your own. There's plenty in there. Part two. We're now going to look at the lives of monks and nuns in the Middle Ages. Some people did more than just go to church on a Sunday. They wanted to give their whole lives to worshipping God. These people were called monks, who were men, and nuns, who were women. There are still monks and nuns today, but not so many as there were in the Middle Ages. Monks and nuns lived in monasteries and convents. Studying a, mo a, a monastery building can tell us a lot about the things that monks and nuns did. So let's have a look at some examples. Some monasteries were huge. Their churches were just as impressive as cathedrals full of statues, stained glass and paintings. Here's one such example. And here's another. Notice that actually there are some big similarities between these buildings. There tends to be a large church building with a square se a selection of buildings next to it known as the cloister. This is where the monks would eat, where they would have their libraries and where they would often have their working rooms. Around the outside we can see other buildings such as the infirmary where the, the sick would be helped and also the hostelry where people would be taken in if they were travellers and they needed help. You might also be able to see in the colour picture some fields where food is being grown for the monks. Although often monasteries owned whole farms rather than just little strips of land. So describe what a monastery was and then explain how this is different to just a plain old church. Pause the video while you do this. So hopefully we've identified that a monastery is a special type of church where monks and nuns actually live it's not just where they worship, it's where they live too. 
Hopefully also we're able to explain that whereas a church is a centre for the local community, a monastery is a place for monks and nuns to worship and a place for them to live. It's very separate from the community. You might even notice that they've got walls built around them, which really helps highlight this sense of being separate. So how did someone become a monk? In the Middle Ages, a boy might go into a monastery, the place where monks live, when he was just seven years old. At first, he would be called a novice, which meant that he was learning to be a monk. He would learn to sing and read and write Latin. He might also learn a special skill such as writing or art so that he could work in the monastery. Some follow-up tasks then. Describe who might go and live in a monastery and then describe the skills that a novice monk might learn. Pause the video while you do this. It should only take you about five minutes. Okay, so what next? One of the first things that would happen to a novice is that his hair was cut short on the top of his head. You might have seen this in, with monks before, it's known as a tonsure. This showed that he was training to be a monk. When he was 16, he could become a monk properly, but first he had to promise three things. Never to own anything, never to marry, and to obey the head monk called the abbot. Your next task then, add to your notes about the novice monk and the work that they did and things that they had to do. Why do you think that the monks had to obey these rules? Explain what you think for each one. Again, about five minutes for this, pause the video while you complete those tasks. So what about those rules? Never own anything, never marry, and to obey the head monk. This is about the monk trying to get rid of their worldly possessions and anything that might distract them from God. If they saw that other monks owned things that were better than them, they might become jealous, and that would be a sin. Equally, if they were seen to be living too good a lifestyle, then people might become jealous of them too. They were supposed to be showing that they were people who were devoting their entire lives to God rather than living a life of luxury. Often, though, monasteries did become fabulously wealthy, and some monks, especially the abbots, did leave a very uh, lavish lifestyle. Also, within the society of monks, there have been potentially hundreds of people living on the same site, and so it was important that they followed the rules. The abbot would often call a daily meeting at a place called the chapter house, where they would read out a chapter from the Bible, that's why it's called that, and also read out the rules of St. Benedict, which dictated how the monks were supposed to live their lives. So monks had constant reminders of the rules that were in place, and really they had no excuse if they broke them. Being a monk was not an easy option in life. Monks could not even own a handkerchief of their own, and most of the day was spent in absolute silence. If they broke a rule of the monastery, they might be whipped or have to go without food. Most monasteries produced their own food and sometimes goods to sell. Some offered shelter to travellers or the poor, or looked after the sick. There was always plenty to do. So let's have a look at an example of a typical monk's life. A monk's day was incredibly long and incredibly regimented. In other words, they had to do things at a certain time. A bell would ring out at the monastery church to tell them what time it was. Firstly, they would wake up at 2.30 in the morning and they would have their first round of prayers at 3 a.m. They might get a chance to go back to bed briefly after that point, but they were up again at 6 a.m. for their first mass or church service of the day. Then at 7, they might be scribing or writing and at 8, they would finally get their breakfast. At 9 a.m., they might be gardening or growing food. Then after that, they'll be doing craft work, producing beautiful things. They might do some fishing. Many monasteries kept fish ponds so there was always a supply of fish to eat and because they weren't allowed to eat meat on Fridays, fishing was seen as the next best thing because they were, weirdly, allowed to eat fish, even though fish is technically meat. At 12 noon they would take part in their next mass or church service and at 2pm was lunchtime. Clearly this is not the whole of the monk's day but it gives you an idea as to how busy their day would be. Note down the times and the names of the things that they would be doing at each stage. Pause the video while you do this. Here's the remainder of the monk's day. At 3pm they would have a brief moment of recreation. This is one of the few times in which they could actually have a little bit of fun, speak with other monks and maybe have a game of chess. At 4pm they would have more singing and more prayers, before at 5pm finally having their evening meal, although even this would have been done in silence with passages of the Bible being read out. 
Then at 6 p.m. there will be a final church service with, with yet more prayers before going to bed at 6.30 p.m. This might seem quite early, but remember that in winter it would be dark by this point and you couldn't do any work anyway. Also, getting up at 2.30 in the morning meant, meant that the monks would be absolutely tired out anyway, so an early night was very much recommended. Here are not your next tasks. Note down what part of a monk's, parts of a monk's life surprises you, and then explain why it surprises you. Then consider the whole day. Were these expectations on the monks fair? Whatever your answer, remember the monks did have to do these. And lastly, do you think being a monk was an attractive way of life for medieval people? Explain why, whatever you think. Pause the video while you complete that. Okay, we're going to go on and just quickly consider the life of the nuns. Nuns' lives are actually quite similar to the monks, so we won't look at them in a great deal of detail extra, but here are some key differences. Nuns were women who wanted to devote their entire lives to God, and it was normal to have to pay to join a nunnery or convent, so many nuns were the unmarried daughters of rich families or the widows of rich men. So, your tasks here, describe who the nuns were, and then explain why the nuns often came from wealthy families. Pause the video while you do that. Life for a nun was much the same as it was for a monk. They obeyed the chief nun who was called an abbess and lived by similar rules. However, nunneries in the Middle Ages were a little less strict than the monasteries, and some nun nuns owned a few possessions. They even had pen pets and occasionally went on holidays. There's that word, holy days, again. The monks and nunnery, the uh, monasteries rather, and nunneries were incredibly important. Check out this map of England. Every single one of these named places was a major monastery in England. This map shows all the important monasteries and nunneries in England up until the time of Henry VIII at least, and in future lessons you'll learn about why they disappeared. So what does it tell us about the importance of monasteries and nunneries in the Middle Ages? Note down your answer to that before we move on to the very final task, and pause the video while you do it. So, ultimately, why was the church so important? Note Dana down a final summarising sentence explaining why overall the church was so important in the lives of medieval people. Pause the video while you do this, but other than that, that's the end of the lesson. Thanks very much for listening and watching. I hope it's been useful to you, and if it has, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. Goodbye!